Hi, ActiveHistory.ca is happy to present a recording of the roundtable, History Under Harper, a micro-lecture discussion. It was part of Congress 2013 and co-sponsored by the Canadian Political Science Association. Please note that the opinions expressed are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of their respective associations and affiliations. You can find recordings of other talks at ActiveHistory.ca. Uh, and so first on the program, uh, Yasmin Abulabin from the University of Alberta, Political Science Department. Yasmin. Okay, well thanks, Matt. So I think there is a compelling rationale to bring together historians and political scientists together in the context of today's Canada, because what we are seeing from the Harper Conservatives is a very conscious and explicit effort to reshape the public symbols and representations of Canadian history, Canadian citizenship, and Canadian identity. So in the time that I have, I want to look at one trend that concerns me, and that is when public representations of Canada reflect a singular narrative of Canadian history rather than narratives in the plural. So back in October of 2012, the Harper Conservatives announced a plan to transform the Canadian Museum of Civilization into a new Canadian Museum of History. Now this plan is still in the works, but it has raised some protests, including from the Canadian Association of University Teachers, the body that represents academic staff in colleges and universities in Canada. And the Canadian Association of University Teachers sees this as an attempt to displace social history. Now rather than this recent decision around the future direction of the Canadian Museum of Civilization being a discrete event, I think that what we can see with the Harper Conservatives is a pattern in which military history and patriotic citizenship are being valorized over social history and multicultural citizenship. Perhaps this is most clearly illustrated in a new citizenship guide released in 2009, which Ian McKay and Jamie Swift suggest is rebranding Canada as a warrior nation. It's interesting that Immigration and Multiculturalism Minister Jason Kenney explicitly aimed this guide not only at new immigrants studying for the citizenship test, but at the national memory of all Canadians. Patriotic citizenship is also seen in numerous speeches by uh, Stephen Harper and Jason Kenney. It's seen in the 28 million committed to commemorating the War of 1812 last year. And it's seen in the image devoted to the World War I battle of Vimy Ridge on the new $20 bill. Now I want to be clear that I'm not objecting to any commemoration of military history. And moreover, I would certainly endorse explicitly engaging a discussion of what we talk about when we talk about war, to paraphrase Noah Richler. The question I'm really raising is whether military history is all that should be primarily commemorated and stressed in public documents, public institutions, and public symbols. So I'll conclude by giving three reasons why I see it as important to have public recognition of social history. So first, as a political scientist, I've looked at the demands for multiculturalism in Canada over many years, and these demands reflect on the fact that people, diverse collectivities, groups in Canada, want to see themselves in public institutions and in the telling of the past and the present. Right now, I think it's very evident that many Canadians would not see themselves in Harper's national narrative. Second, <laughs> um, Canadian politics, uh, secondly, has been shaped by different and sometimes even clashing historical narratives. It's a disservice to our understanding of Canada, our understanding of others, and even ultimately our shared political community to not attend to this. And then finally, at a scholarly level, thanks to work over many decades, we have a considerable and growing body of research that covers social history, and it's simply anti-intellectual to ignore it. So unlike Stephen Harper, who has so implored Canadians to not commit sociology, I think we need to be drawing from political science, history, sociology, and all the knowledge that is there. <laughs> Now we have Adam Chapnick from Canadian Forces College. Adam. Yes, I'm a federal public servant, but there are about 170 of us in the country who have complete academic freedom, and I'm one of them, just to <laughs> clarify. Uh, two observations, one argument, two explanations. Three minutes. Observation number one, almost all Canadians, including all conservatives and their supporters, 
I took Canadian history in high school, um, period. Observation number two, tens if not hundreds of thousands of Canadians, including conservatives and their supporters, took Canadian history courses in universities taught by many of us here. So the argument, if, and I'm focusing on academic historians, not public historians for whom uh, this doesn't really apply because they're doing what I'd like them to do, if as academic historians we feel that the Harper government doesn't understand what history is or what its purpose is, I think we must acknowledge that we must be at least in part responsible for a failure to communicate over the last couple of decades. Two explanations as to why this might be. Number one, in spite of the way that we as historians value evidence, and we always do, we don't seem to value it as much when it comes to approaches to promoting student learning in the classroom. How many, how many academic historians read the cognitive science literature? How many academic historians participate in the scholarship of teaching and learning? How many academic historians go to conferences on teaching and learning and how to promote it in our classrooms today? We may not be bad teachers, but if we use evidence-based <laughs> research, we might be better and more effective. We might not have some of these problems. Explanation number two. In spite of history's move to, to inclusivity over the last three or four decades, when it comes to the audience that we've focused on as academic historians, we've become systemically, increasingly exclusive. There is no reward in the academic world for writing a high school textbook. If I went up for promotion or tenure and I had an app, high school textbook as my prime uh, example of scholarship versus a University of Toronto press book, which one would get me further? Let's be honest here. So we don't incentivize pre uh, contributing to the high school curriculum the way that we should. How about 25 op-eds in the Toronto Star versus one article in International History Review? Which one's going to count more for me when I'm up for promotion? Again, if that's the way we set up the system, we can't be that surprised that the government doesn't look to us and that the public doesn't understand the way that we see things. We've promoted a brand of history that is insular when it comes to the way we do things. It may be an informed brand, it may be an educated brand, but it's far too insular. I think that what the Harper government's doing should be viewed as a wake-up call to us to look in the mirror and reconsider the way that we as academic historians do business. And our next round tabler is Lyle Dick, uh, former president of the CHA, if I get that right, uh, and now consulting this Lyle Dick History and Heritage. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt. As I uh, mentioned in a presentation at a session uh, we organized at the National Council of Public History in late April, uh, since the Massey Commission of the 1950s, uh, Canadians have depended on significant government support for uh, all manner of culture and heritage programs in publishing, broadcasting, pop popular music, scientific research, visual art museums, and historic sites development. And our attachment uh, to the nation state generally rests on less, less on strident patriotism than on a continuing relationship to these national institutions, which are integral to Canadian identity. And up until relatively recently, uh, I don't think they were overly politicized. Of course, there always was a political dimension. Uh, this, in my mind, began to change under the previous government of uh, Prime Minister Chrétien when um, uh, Minister of Canadian Heritage Sheila Copps uh, promoted uh, patriotic history. And we see this in the nationalistic storylines of the Canadian War Museum and uh, the CBC production, Canada People's History. Uh, and this process seems to be, have been taken much farther by the current government uh, through its Road to 17 uh, commemorative program uh, that has been prescribed for virtually all federal departments and agencies, the promotion of military history, as we heard, through commemorations of the War of 1812, uh, forthcoming <laughs> commemorations of the centennial of the First World War, and the recently announced Commons Heritage Committees review of history programs about which we had a very good discussion uh, at the Downtown Art Gallery a couple of days ago. Well, any efforts to politicize or harness history to patriotic purposes should be questioned. There may be a potential upside to the increased interest in and visibility of history at the national level. And presumably we want uh, Canad as many Canadians as possible to engage with our individual and collective past. What we won't support 
our arbitrary decisions to include or exclude stories or events from our past according to particular political agendas. And that's why the Canadian Historical Association immediately wrote to the Commons Heritage Committee to express its concerns and insist that if this review is to be undertaken, it must be professionalized. It must be carried out in a professional manner. It w must rely on the advice of professional historians and history-related disciplines, which of course would include political scientists, anthropologists, and uh, archaeologists, among others. In my view, the promotion of military history is not the problem. Uh, but the, any replacement of social history by military history would be a problem. Um, and indeed, there's many aspects to our military history which are not in the traditional national narratives. The uh, PTSD among uh, soldiers, uh, the witch hunt of gay and lesbian soldiers in the Second World War, and so on. So there can be no turning back on the knowledge advances of social history of the last two generations. Uh, we're also concerned with the uh, de-staffing of 31 national historic sites in the 2012 budget, which indeed cut out many important social history programs in Parks Canada's uh, commemorate, commemorative um, initiatives. And so that has to be taken to, into account as well. I can assure you that the Canadian Historical Association <laughs> will continue to be focused on advancing the uh, treatment of history in its manifold diversity. Thank you. Next on the program is Elvin Finkel from Athabasca University. He's also a historian. Okay, well, Stephen Harper's efforts to reshape what is researched, taught, and presented as Canadian history need to be viewed in the context of this Prime Minister's larger, very liberal agenda to shape the Canadian present and future. Despite the embrace of neoliberal policies by both PC and Liberal governments in the 80s and 90s, Harper, as president of the National Citizens Coalition, claimed in 2000 that, quote, Canada appears content to become a second-tier socialistic country boasting ever more loudly about its economy and its social services to mask its second-rate status, unquote. Shortly afterwards, his name appeared first on the firewall letter to Alberta's Premier Klein, calling for Alberta to become a semi-sovereign state in order to stand up <coughs> decentralizing, socializing liberal federal governments. Alberta, which had gone farther than the federal government in rolling back the post-war welfare state and unashamedly declaring the right of capital to rule without state mediation on behalf of the public, was salvation to Harper. When he re-entered federal politics, his goal was to spread the Alberta model to the federal sphere rather than contain it behind a firewall. In my view, the attack of the Harper government on the independence of scientists, on all suggestions that the tar sands produce climate change, on proper statistics gathering, on sociology, on the welfare state, and on limits to the movement of capital lead naturally to the need to reshape our national history and national mm -hmm. identity. How, for example, can he lead us to a brave new world of muscular entrepreneurship and manly attacks against nations that for whatever reason seem a threat to his aggressive capitalist agenda if we think of ourselves as a country of apologetic, moderate, caring peacemongers. <laughs> now that image is indeed overdrawn. It's not our real history either. <clears throat> and where it suits his agenda, Harper does try to confirm it. We have no history of colonialism, he told a press conference in Pittsburgh in 2009 at the announcement that Canada would host the G20 meeting. Uh, in 2010. He knows better, but his overall message is the Canadians little to atone for, except perhaps the forced sending of Native children to residential schools that Paul Martin has correctly labeled cultural genocide. So he cuts money to Lar Library and Archives Canada and Parks Canada that go to providing the means and the products that depict a history of diversity and controversy. And he tries to turn our Museum of Civilization into a Canadian Museum of History focused on honoring Canadian heroes <coughs> and achievers the forerunners of today's intrepid Canadian global entrepreneurs who are, of course, never engaged in colonialism. <laughs> Meanwhile, he invests $28 million in an effort to create a history of the war of 1812 without nuance <clears throat> and with intervention by the PMO with the Department of Canadian Heritage in every detail, including what dress the actress portraying Laura Secord should be wearing. He launches an investigation into provincial practices in the teaching of history to see whether certain World War I and World War II battles are emphasized. This kind of shallowing of the history pool leads to fantasy land history to go with the fantasy land science and sociology that this government's restrictive practices favor, and they all need to be opposed in the name of legitimate inquiry and rational thought. Thank you. There's no way he didn't time that. <laughs>
<laughs> Kira Ladner from Political Science, University of Manitoba. Talking about Harper's history, I think we have to really talk more correctly about Harper's disregard for history. In the effort to create a singular history, a unifying history, is really one that reframes and represents Canada as a British settler society, but as we just heard, we forget the fact that it is a settler society and just a British society. It is the idea that Canada is, of course, as Harper said, a history without colonialism. And that ignoring that history is not just creating a singular history, but creating a reification of British North America without a, re without a reification of settler society within that a unified nation, a singular nation, one nation, one sovereign, let's forget everyone else. In this view of this homogenizing history, it's become very interesting. <laughs> of course, lights are out on indigenous people. <laughs> but it is really a, a reframing of history which not only denies indigenous people, it denies indigenous sovereignty, it denies indigenous, indigenous territoriality. It is not just in the museums or in Harper's uh, signaling of 1812 as our most historic event with, of course, possibly Indian allies, but it is also a recasting of history which has ignored probably the most significant event in Canadian history for most Indigenous people, and that is this year's anniversary of the 1763 uh, Royal Proclamation and the 1764 uh, the Treaty of Niagara, which succeeded it a year later. It is this history which actually allows for Canada to exist on Indigenous land. And it is this history, I think, that is not only going to be recast as really minor, but should be if we are to take the stance of idle no more and actually start thinking about what it means to be in Canada on Indigenous land. It is this history of 1863, 1763 that we should actually stand up for and start learning about as historians and political scientists and other academics, because I failed to see 1763 and the Treaty of Niagara adequately represented any history textbook that I have yet to read, any political science textbook that I have yet to read. And as a Canadianist, which I sometimes really regret to say, I think that that leaving out of history is not only about Harper's history, but is in fact about the way in which we understand our history as a settler society rather than a settler society on Indigenous land. And the Royal Proclamation 1763, the, British, or the Treaty of Niagara, which brought together 2,000 chiefs and talked about how do we live together on this land is, I think, one of the most important events in Canadian history. One which Harper will ignore, one which Harper will not allow in his new Museum of History or on any bill that we see, but I think it is up to us as scholars to actually start taking this to task and remain idle no more. Uh, Jocelyne Letourneau, uh, Université Laval. Well, sorry for History. those who, uh, yeah, for, sorry for those who listen to me Monday night. I'll basically <laughs> say the same thing, and I'll be brief. Um, any aspect I touch uh, quickly, we may come back in the discussion period. The theme of our panel is Harper and history. It could be, it could have been as well, Marois and history. For what is happening in in Canada is going on in Quebec too. A government wants to twist the historical narrative of the society it regulates in order to fit its political purpose. Why has Harper brought back the royal branding in the symbolic landscape of the country? And why has he emphasized the importance of 1812 in the making of the nation? I'll stress only on these two uh, initiatives. I see this operation as a reaction to the possible limits of, pa of the paradigm that was central to the Canadian project in the last 40 years, namely multiculturalism. For sure, the idea and politics of multiculturalism has not been dropped off by the Canadian government yet. Many in the back rooms of the federal state acknowledge the limits of this form of representation of the country. Saying that multiculturalism was to break out Quebec's nationalism is true but short. In fact, Trudeau's wedding was to go over the frame of the two solitudes. He wanted also to build a country free of ethnic politics, according to him, improductive for the future of both Quebec and Canada. The Trudeau project felt short of its promise. The two solitudes have evolved into lassitudes. 
And it is fine the sky to think that Quebec will participate in a national project defined from coast to coast. More alarming, perhaps, at least for thinkers of the Canadian nation, multiculturalism has undermined the country in terms of its historicity. Civic patriotism has took over the historical roots of Canada, withering the substance of the country in the process. If national identity has brought in and surface, it has thinned down in depth. It seems more and more utopic to base Canada on an idea of multiculturalism that weakens the country in expanding. Harper may have decided to do something before it's too late. Hence, for it is useless to deny the specificity of Quebec in Canada, he has given Quebec a form of recognition, that of being a nation within a nation. Independentists said it was full. Fair enough. It was nonetheless a significant action. English Canada had also to be restored in its historicity, around which symbols to do it, recognizing the constitutive Britishness of the country was a move. Distinguishing Canada from its powerful neighbor was a second one. Other moves may come shortly. In this context, bringing back royal symbols and making the War of 1812 a milestone in the building of Canada as a specific nation give their full meaning. These initiatives participate in the symbolic reshaping of Canada at a moment where the country seems looking for a new base to face its present dissonances and to move in the future as a nation with depth and strength. If Harper stays in power, and we should not assume he will not, mm -hmm. Canadian identity will be remade around four pillars. Symbolic recognition of First Nations input in the making of the nation. Symbolic recognition of Quebecers forming a nation within Canadian nation. Recognition of Britishness as a specific fit. Yeah, I read slow in English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Recognition of Britishness as a specific feature of Canadianness. Insistence on the will of Canadians to build a country of their own, sometimes through defensive military action, therefore to be honored as central features of Canadian historicity and in Canadian history. At the core of the symbolic space formed by these four pillars will remain the idea of Canada as a nation of different people and cultures living together on the basis of three additional platforms. First, yes, reservation to violence, politics as a way to resolve disagreements, openness for uncommon political layouts. In this refer last sentence, in this refurbished mm. Canadian historicity, Harper thinks will be pumped up the oil, think of it there mm. here, yes. that will drive the country in its future and make it a flourishing land. Bets are open on the trial. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Now we have Alain Noel, um, Université de Montréal, who is a political scientist. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Matt, for inviting me to this prestigious, well-attended, uh, and unusual for me panel, uh, speak connecting history and political science. Um, in the spirit of the times, I will uh, uh, cut short on facts and evidence and <laughs> <laughs> go straight to the conclusions uh, and, and uh, that already f f you can foresee what I'm going to say. I'm going to submit to you uh, three ideas. Uh, uh, the first idea is that um, as a political scientist perhaps that's my bias but I, I'm, uh, I tend to uh, I just want to state that however important they may be the symbolic changes that we are uh, discussing today are uh, to some extent a sideshow to a more profound uh, transformation of the country of, of the social fabric uh, inequality is rising in Canada poverty is increasing uh, the environment is deteriorating the cap state capacity is also diminished uh, our international reputation is uh, challenged uh, and we have to keep in mind and I was re uh, with a wink, I guess I, I would say that the conservatives are and some sort, I know I'm twisting the term, but some sort of misrecognized materialist. You know, they, they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, that's their primary uh, field of action is really uh, modifying policies. Very often, uh, uh, in, for, for long run purpose, like with pensions, for example, uh, measures that will apply in a tax system also. Uh, so just a reminder, and that's, I guess, most of what I do uh, has to do with this part of uh, reality. So that's number one. Uh, number two, beyond symbols. Number two, uh, and that uh, that was my opening li line, I guess. But uh, Canadian society and the Canadian state is also becoming uh, a less intelligent, dumbier uh, society mm -hmm. state, uh, where uh, evidence, scientific practices is deteriorating respect for s the social sciences in particular. I don't have to uh, go at length uh, on this. But I, 
there's another sense in which we are becoming a less intelligent society, not only uh, less respect for social science and evidence, but also less respect for <coughs> collective intelligence, the capacity of citizens to come together and meet and discuss, interact, and find better solutions through uh, collective action and interactions and negotiations, discussions, deliberation. Uh, so we're becoming less good at that. Uh, and uh, third uh, and, and final, um, we, we used to have uh, some years ago the expression, and it was not very appreciated, I think, uh, Canada outside Quebec, uh, and it, we sort of dropped it along the way. Uh, but uh, in a way, what we're seeing now, and I, here I disagree a little bit with Jocelyn, is uh, Quebec outside Canada. The new image of, true enough, there, there's been this uh, recognition of Quebec, I'll just uh, one, two sentences, recognition uh, by uh, the House of Commons of Quebec as a, as a nation, but the new mold uh, uh, or the new symbolic representation of Canada really is at a very, it's increasingly at a distance from modern Quebec society in all respects. It's an Anglosphere, militarist, foreign policy, a, monarchi mm -hmm. a monarchist, uh, British Empire type of cultural orientation. Uh, in many, many ways, uh, there's a distance that is being established between Quebec. It's a distance that I think in Quebec we're responsible for as well. Uh, but uh, certainly the new symbolics of Canada is, is uh, very unappealing to Quebecers. Thank you very much. Now we have Veronica Strongbog, a historian at the University of British Columbia. And Matt was my RA, so he better not ever use that on me. Uh, um, I just want to add generally, and I agree pretty much with what people have said, I just want to remind you, and I'm, I know most of you know all of this stuff, that Harper and the threat to history and evidence-based research that he presents is not new. Uh, it's not restricted to one party, uh, but it has clearly accelerated uh, under his regime. Uh, I want to argue that uh, the work that many of us have been doing here and have been doing uh, more generally uh, in feminist scholarship has been, in fact, in the last 30 years, I would argue, breaking uh, the cake of patriarchal custom and that feminist scholarship, women's movements, and public <laughs> policy have been really deeply influenced uh, by women's uh, research on women, women, and research on gender, and which history has played a central role, and indeed historians and political scientists working through history have played a central role. And that the promise of this scholarship, which has always been closely connected to social policy, has been transformation and agency for disadvantaged people, women, Aboriginal peoples, workers, and so on. And that the part of the response to this has been some policy shifts, to be sure. But what we've seen is the uh, um, acceleration and um, strengthening of the new right. But the new right is really an old misogyny. It, it looks familiar to those of us who've studied the 19th century. And for them, too, history is very significant. Uh, but it's a history that uh, really celebrates a politics of nostalgia uh, and that plays the game of blame, plays it for Aboriginal peoples and it certainly plays it for feminists as well. And for both groups and for other groups like workers as well, it's important for the Harper conservatives to delegitimize data and to deny and to deny and to deny evidence just as they do with the environment. They offer us distractions such as the community historical pr recognition program. Look at that on, on the website. It's, it's uh, completely worthless. Uh, mm -hmm. They have been busily degendering uh, public policy, and part of the efforts to degender public policy and failure to address uh, social justice is about invalidating and delegitimizing uh, history and the work that we do. In fact, it's a fundamental attack on democracy as we understand it. So I want to argue that our response should be to defend feminist research, history, and political policy to move beyond nostalgia and towards equity. And in particular, that we have to emphasize uh, progressive partnerships and scholarship and activism and the inclusion of feminist uh, insights throughout them. We see this in the Canadian Centre for Policy Analysis, we see it in Idle No More, and we see it in Much Union Research. The influence of feminist arguments regarding the partiality of scholarship, the importance of standpoint and intersectionality, and the recognition that neutrality is an illusion should be central uh, to scholarship uh, and to the uh, uh, shifts in public policy. Uh, that we need to recognize that scholarship and activism ought to go hand in hand in defending social justice and democracy. 
history means much today. Uh, we can analyze the past on its own terms without descending to presentism or anachronism, and all the while appreciating how past decisions lead to present circumstances. And these circumstances are becoming increasingly dire, as some speakers have mentioned. For example, we can appreciate that former policymakers were creatures of their own times, as they privileged uh, propertied men. Uh, and we can use that knowledge to help us understand why advantages and disadvantages today are not inevitable or natural, as Harper would suggest, but a product of human choice and thus mutable through agency and policy. That we need to defend the right to gather data and to make connections between evidence and public policy. We see this in uh, now many feminist scholars involved in actions such as Canadian women in the literary arts. And uh, recently uh, I've been running the women's suffrage uh, org uh, website, which is a pro-democracy website. And I will just have my conclusion. Uh, while the <laughs> angst and uncertainty of our age have no simple <laughs> answers, reactionary nostrums coming from neoliberal governments and new right ideologues compromise equality and well-being. The full tidings of modern <laughs> scholarship offer, in contrast, footholds on a braver world. To that end, uh, our website, like others, does not stand on the sidelines. It invites contributors and readers to make connections between past and present, between power and privilege, between Canada and the world, all the while viewing the position of women and girls as a key indicator of the health of social democracy. Canadian feminist writer Margaret Atwood once reminded Amnesty International that a voice is a gift and that silence is ultimately a sign of powerlessness, a position that feminists and scholars <laughs> have good reason to repudiate. Um, and I want to bring to your attention uh, that political scholars fiddle while Rome burns, which was in the Globe and Mail yesterday, which says that fat-ass <laughs> academics don't address public policy and are not taking up the challenge of the Harper government. And I want us to prove them wrong. Thank you. Daniel Weinstock, a political philosopher at the Université de Montréal. McGill. McGill. I've got you down as Montréal. I've moved to McGill. Yeah. He's moved to McGill. Um, there you go. Um, so as a, as a bilingual Montrealer and a Quebecer, I have to say that I find uh, the concern that brings us together in huge numbers over uh, the use by the Harper government of the powers of the state to reform uh, Canadian identity uh, somewhat uh, bemusing and amusing. As a bilingual Montrealer, I have spent uh, years and years watching our provincial government uh, attempt to write uh, English Canadians and English Montrealers out of the history uh, of our city. And as a Quebecer, I went from my political sort of maturity into my political middle age under a government that attempted to use all of the powers uh, of the state in order to rewrite uh, Canadian identity, in order to uh, d deny its constitutive uh, multinationality. So um, I think that uh, there is an issue here. Yes, governments use uh, the powers of the state to define identity in a way that is congruent with their political ideology in ways that I find distasteful. But the point, the first point that I want to make is that Harper is not the first to do so. Uh, and I wonder whether there has, there has been, at some point in the last 20 years, a room this full uh, bemoaning uh, the Trudeau Liberals' uh, rewriting of uh, Canadian identity in a way which denied, in particular, uh, the particular national contribution of Quebec to our country. So that's my first point. My second point is, I think that there is a way of joining this question, which has not been addressed yet by any of, uh, of the speakers, and I really want us to keep our eye on the ball. Um, a, a few years ago, those of you uh, who remember prorogation, remember that. Uh, remember that I uh, got myself into a little bit of trouble, and some people in this room may actually have signed a letter that uh, I, uh, I addressed uh, first to the Globe and Mail, and it got uh, around a little bit, saying that, look, we have a lot of uh, parliamentary conventions here that are crucial to the success, the way in which our democracy functions, that are grounded in a set of historical, there I use the H word, uh, understandings about how these institutions should and should not be used. Ours is largely an unwritten constitution which is based upon uh, the understanding that the men and women in power will cleave to some degree to those historical conventions in the use that they make of the powers that are at their disposal. The Harper government has shown, I think, in ways that are exceptional relative to the other uh, governments that I've named up until now, uh, hearty uh, disregard for those uh, conventions and have eroded our democracy in ways that seem to me to be much more problematic than the sort of attempted uh, same old, same old reshaping 
something of identity that they've been engaged in. They are, call themselves the conservative party. I think that one of the things that we should worry about the most is just misleading labeling. In order to be a conservative, you would have to need to want to conserve something. And it doesn't seem to me that the conservatives are very keen on conserving much about the historical grounding of some of our more central, most central democratic institutions, conventions, and tools, and that's the ball that we need to keep our eye on, it seems to me. This identity, attempted identity formation, will come and go. The next guys will do it in their own way, whether it's Tom or Justin or uh, whoever else, um, <laughs> and it doesn't, the, the, the saving grace is that it doesn't tend to work, right? There is a resistance at the base which makes it the case that people don't allow their identities to be reshaped in the way that their leaders would want. Uh, but these other changes that I pointed to are much more durable and permanent and dangerous. Thank you. Reg Whitaker, political scientist, University of Victoria. Hi. I uh, assume as a political scientist that when we talk about Harper in history, we're not talking about history as it is understood by any of the scholarly criteria that we normally apply. Mm -hmm. We're talking about history as used when it's used by politicians or by states uh, as uh, instruments in support of political projects. So I want to uh, address the question of what is Harper's political project uh, that he's using history for. Mm -hmm. And I think, in the first instance, this has to be defined against the long decades of liberal rule that preceded. Uh, the Harper conservatives uh, see themselves as outsiders, you know, outsiders regionally. Remember, the West wants in, and the Reform Party, ideologically and psychologically, uh, seeing themselves as confronting an Ottawa in which, as they see it, the bureaucracy. Uh, the uh, the media, uh, academia, et cetera, et cetera, has all been part of some kind of liberal uh, Canada, uh, which they have set out to change. And when you look at what the liberal view of history was, um, there's already been some references to it already, um, and um, you know, I'll just pick out a few things here. Uh, obviously, the sort of bilingual national unity, uh, the colony to nation uh, uh, narrative uh, and liberal internationalism in foreign policy with peacekeeping at the center. I'll just pick those out as, uh, as particular issues. And, and how uh, the Harper conservatives are trying uh, to, to the best of their ability systematically to confront and, and, uh, and change that, that narrative. Um, now, I, 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 the, the what is the political narrative then in the, encoded in the various historical forays of the of the Harper government? What I can discern here is, in fact, a lack of consistent narrative meaning, bordering on sometimes on outright ideological incoherence. Um, for instance, the renewed emphasis on Britishness, uh, loyalist history, symbols of monarchy, etc., that uh, we're you know familiar with. Um, uh, recently. Now, this was not, in fact, at the very start, at the onset, and it was that period of time when Harper thought that he was actually going to win Quebec over uh, into the conservative, uh, into the conservative uh, fold. And uh, it's, this is subsequent, and I think this has to be seen as a very uh, simple pol political project. Remember, after the, the prorogation crisis and so on, the uh, the warnings about the separatist socialist coalition, mm -hmm. um, and uh, which is embodied in the NDP as the official opposition, with the you know with the uh, dominance in Quebec at the moment, uh, and this is a way of contesting NDP liberal command over Quebec, um, generating responses in the rest of the of the country, uh, and. Um, it, it, but it clashes with the, with the partisan drive of the Harper government uh, to, in fact, try to encompass ethnic communities mm -hmm. uh, into the, and that image of British uh, Canada is, in fact, an, a, a historical image which has, you know, histor is excluded, marginalized, and and in some senses humiliated many minority communities. So um, we really see, I think, an incoherence between. Uh, a, a liberal, uh, sorry, a conservative government that is trying this kind of political project at the same time as they are also trying to govern in much the same way, suspiciously like the liberal predecessors yeah. 
building a national coalition, and it isn't adding up. We are all now so uh, fortunate to have on the program two discussants who graciously agreed uh, to think on their feet and offer some reactions to what we've heard. And we'll start with Abigail Eisenberg, a political scientist here at the University of Victoria. Yes, that's right. First thing we're going to do is take a look. I just heard all right, too. Um, so, uh, so there's lots of food for thought, and I don't need to. I'm sure you have a lot of questions, but uh, one, uh, let me just make a couple of observations. First of all, it's interesting that in an era where there's very low voter turnout, where there's a talk of democratic deficits, the irrelevance of parliamentary government, here we see a prime minister doing something that is changing the nature of the country in all sorts of ways, and in fact, changing our institutions. Some people have talked about in the panel institutions, other people have talked about the symbolic uh, uh, residence <coughs> of some of these changes, but this, this particular, and I wouldn't say this particular party, I would say this particular Prime Minister's office, the PMO, is having just a uh, absolute, a, a, a devastating effect across a variety of different institutions. I tend to agree with those people who say that this is nothing new. Um, I tend to think that uh, this is what prime ministers do. This is the nature of uh, the institution. Sometimes you like what they do. Sometimes you don't so much like what you do. Sometimes you're the product, actually. I mean, I grew up, uh, I think Trudeau was uh, uh, voted in in 68 when I was like six years old, and I grew up being a Trudeau person in Alberta, mind you, so that makes me a little. Uh, but, um, but I don't think the manipulation of public institutions or history is anything new, um, and I think that's amplified by the speakers. Um, I think that what is, uh, and I also would point out that, uh, that we see the, uh, let me just give you some examples to remind you, the destruction of professionalism, um, the weakening of the opposition through destroying parliamentary traditions. Some people have talked about the destruction of multiculturalism. I'm not so uh, sure about that. There's certainly a rejigging of that agenda. But like Reg, I'm wondering how is that making sense for this government? I'm really not understanding why they're doing that and how that makes sense for them. Uh, the weakening of all sorts of institutional supports that help facilitate the mobilization of particular groups. And actually, that's what I think is especially interesting, mm -hmm. is the weakening, is what we see it from this government, and I guess from previous governments, is the weakening of institutional supports that support the mobilization of civil society groups. Mm -hmm. uh, because civil society groups are where we expect a lot of the social change to come from. So we're, I, I find it, as a political scientist, very interesting to see that uh, getting rid of the census and what that does to civil society mm -hmm. groups, uh, alienating the independent and professional advice that uh, the government otherwise relied on from universities and various think tanks, uh, alienating the scientific community, all of this is uh, has the <laughs> effect of, uh, of, uh, of, of actually um, uh, weakening mobilization. But let me leave you with two less uh, dire and uh, pessimistic uh, things to think about. Number one is that with respect to the mobilization of civil society groups, Canada is not an island. Uh, Canada exists within an international atmosphere. And in fact, with respect to identity politics, identity politics is an international thing. It occurs because of decisions that come down from international courts, because of activities that go on elsewhere in the world. And we are not isolated from those things. And many of our best civil society groups, including our feminist groups, our uh, indigenous groups, get a tremendous amount of support from those international contacts. So that's a bit of sunshine. The other thing is that Parliament and uh, we have independent institutions. And one of the interesting independent institutions that we have, and I will just mention one that I study, is the judiciary. So some of the things that come from the judiciary, especially around the Quebec-Canada politics, very interesting. 
Harper, it's, that PMO's office cannot control that. And it becomes a very interesting counterpoint. I hope it doesn't become the counterpoint that it is in other countries in the world where you have very conservative reactionary governments and very liberal uh, court institutions where most of the people would rather have the judges uh, as their government. Uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. But maybe that's a little bit of sunshine as well. One more point. Uh, and that is, um, and Brian, I'm sure you're going to talk about this too. I don't understand what the, I'm with Reg, I don't understand what the agenda is here. I, I don't think some of the things make sense in terms of just plain raising Canada's GDP. It, it doesn't make sense to do what, and, and the straight ideological, if, as you uh, pointed out, the straight ideological argument doesn't even make sense. So I think that it's worth discussing what, what is the agenda here. Thanks. And Brian Palmer, historian at Trent University. Thank you. Well, I'm actually glad that there's only three minutes uh, because it'll give me less chance to put my foot in my mouth and get myself into trouble. Um, I think it's it's uh, I, I'm uh, pleased that the uh, I think the consensus on the panel would be that all governing parties and all states are engaged in the cons in the social construction of imagined communities. And so a lot of what the people from Quebec discussed is that this is a problem that has gone on for a long time and it would go back it, it, it is really part of the founding of the nation and it, it's, it's, its construction and the manipulation of symbols of identity uh, in which history is one part um, what is uh, obviously central is that uh, Harper and in his person and in his uh, and in his office has been a more pugnacious uh, right wing uh, populist uh, um, uh, sort of articulation of this. Scholarship has exactly the opposite uh, purpose. It is to complicate the so-called imagined community. It is to actually always challenge, it seems to me, and to question and to uh, create fissures in what are edifices of this imagined community. And so we have a, you know, we're in a, in a difficult spot because simultaneously we want monies from states to support our research. We want support for the research, but we don't want the state uh, meddling in either our bedrooms or in the sort of creation of the, uh, of, of, of the sort of understandings and sensibilities that scholarship tries to address. Now, I think Adam uh, uh, put his finger on a very important point. We haven't done very well compared to uh, I would say the right wing uh, in terms of our capacity to situate ourselves uh, in popular discourses and we need to do much better writing of texts is you know high school text would be one thing but you know writing more in popular venues is another but where I think uh, this actually doesn't go far enough this questioning is it doesn't go far enough in actually addressing why it's so difficult for us to intervene. Yeah. I mean, it is very simple for the Jack Granitz deans and others to sort of come in with the headshot on the news and put forward their position because it intersects with all of the mythologies and all of, they are, they are reproducing in microchip form uh, the ideology of, you know, that, that's, 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 that, that's out there. It is far more difficult for those who are always complicating, uh, diversifying, challenging, raising dissent because the media does not want to buy this. Uh, and that's why professional associations like the CAJ and the Canadian Political Science Association need to be sort of pushing. It's why we need to be pushing. Um, but I'd also say this. It, it, it is up to us as well. Uh, in doing this project of, 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 of complicating to actually open the doors of debate and dissent more. Um, I've actually seen them, I think, in the historical profession close down uh, a bit in the last uh, little while. I see far less debate and discussion and dissent, far more consensus. And a part of that relates to the fact that almost everybody in this room would probably consider themselves part of a left and progressive uh, constituency, their own imagined community. Um, and yet uh, um, the left has never been weaker uh, in, 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 I think, since uh, really very early in the 20th century. We're almost 100 years of, uh, of sort of, of, of demise of the left. 
And so uh, it's a long, long process to rebuild the kinds of the kinds of structures and possibilities that will allow debate, the left, true dissent, uh, and and I think the, extending the project of complicating, you know, understandings of our past and our present, so that we can get to the kind of future that you know all of the panelists addressed in terms of the various constituencies that have been. You know, silence. <laughs> and no bell. No bell. <laughs>